Avatar is one of my favorite shows of all time. I watched it a lot growing up, and I try to go back once a year and rewatch some of my favorite episodes, or just do a full resweep of the series. I love the characters, I love the arcs they go through, I love how they change throughout the show, and I love the depth that each character has. Well, maybe not the Fire Lord, he's kinda just evil for evil's sake. But he provides a target, an end goal for the series, something that our heroes are always working towards. Not to mention, he's voiced by Mark Hamill, so that's always a plus. But this video isn't about him, or even the main protagonist of the show. It's about one character and one episode. I didn't actually watch this episode until about a year and a half ago. Whenever I was younger, I read the description and it just didn't appeal to me. It didn't feature any of the other characters that I was so fond of. In fact, it didn't contain any of the other main cast at all. It was just Zuko. He was the bad guy at the time. Why would I want to watch a whole episode dedicated to the antagonist of a show? So I just skipped it, and in terms of plot, I didn't really miss anything. Nothing significant happens in this episode. You could skip right over it and you wouldn't be completely lost. I think it's a sign of truly great writing when you can make an episode about the villain and with no real plot relevance, and still have it be one of the best episodes in a series that's already flooded with tons of amazing episodes. We open with Zuko at his lowest point in the series. He's lost his ship, his crew, his sister's on the hunt for him, he's recently just gone his separate ways with his uncle, and the thing that drives and motivates his character, restoring his honor by way of capturing the Avatar, it seems further away than ever. He's starving and exhausted, but Zuko forces himself to keep going, to keep pushing. He refuses to allow himself to give up. He keeps moving. This is a small example of the extraordinary willpower that Zuko possesses. It's kind of underplayed in the series, but Zuko's willpower is unrivaled in this show. You see this in his relationship with the Avatar in the first two seasons. All that matters to him is capturing the Avatar. All that matters to him is going home. He doesn't see the Avatar as a person, he doesn't see Aang, he just knows what the Avatar is to him. An opportunity. An opportunity to heal a broken relationship between him and his father. An opportunity to be reunited with the only place he's ever known as home. An opportunity to be at peace. Let's look at this scene. Like I said before, Zuko is starving. He's on his last leg. You can see his face is visibly malnourished, bags under his eyes. Zuko is all but dying. He's riding hard to find any kind of civilization he can, but he skids to a stop when he smells some kind of meat cooking. He sees a man cooking the meat over a campfire, and he doesn't even hesitate to reach for a sword. But then he does hesitate. He sees this man's very pregnant wife sitting under a nearby tree. Zuko sees this and decides to keep riding. I think this is one of the first times in the series that Zuko is humanized. He's not humanized in a way where we see him as the quote unquote good guy, because he is still very much willing to rob and perhaps do much worse to this guy for his food. But he's humanized in a way where we see that even for all his shortcomings, there's still some things that Zuko isn't willing to do, some lines he isn't willing to cross. Here we see Zuko buying some supplies in a rundown Earth Kingdom town. An Earth Kingdom soldier comes over to Zuko, and has a bit of a tense interaction with him, which ends with the soldier taking the supplies he just bought. I think this point is the most fascinating that's raised in this episode. Not only does the audience get to see from Zuko's perspective, we also get a different antagonist. Those soldiers are supposed to protect us from the Fire Nation, but they're just a bunch of thugs. Over and over again throughout the show, we get beat over the head with the fact that the Fire Nation are the bad guys. But here we're shown something a little bit different. We're shown that it's not quite as black and white as that. No, maybe these soldiers aren't outright evil, but they do use their power over the people of this town for their own personal gain. With all the men in fighting condition off for war, these guys are really left without anybody to stand up to them. But the thing is, these are Earth Kingdom soldiers, not Fire Nation, not undercover spies. They're born and raised Earth Kingdom citizens, and Zuko is unable to do anything about it without blowing his cover, without revealing his identity. So he leaves, but not before being offered dinner and a place to sleep for the night by the boy he'd protected from those soldiers. Zuko accepts, since he really doesn't have much of a choice in the matter. He wouldn't make it much further without their help. Before dinner, Zuko offers to help out with the roof of the barn something that we see he has very little, if any, experience in. Here, once again, we see the show beginning to humanize Zuko. It's a little thing, but seeing Zuko pretty much have no idea what he's doing when working on the roof, but still wanting to help out in any way he can, it helps the audience relate to him. 
Throughout the first season, specifically the first couple of episodes, Zuko is more of a well-oiled machine rather than someone the audience can see themselves as. We feel sympathy for his situation with his father and his banishment, but maybe not relate to it. But this? Not wanting to accept charity? Being screwed out of something by someone above you? Feeling like the odds are stacked against you? Feeling alone? These are things we can all relate to. These are things that humanize Zuko to the audience, which by now you may have realized is the goal of this episode. Next, we're led into the first flashback. That's what moms are like. If you mess with their babies, hum, they're gonna <laughs> bite you back. Here's another tiny detail that lets the audience relate to Zuko a bit more. To see how he interacts with his mom is endearing to the viewer. It lets us see that at least at one point in time, that cold exterior was once a lot warmer. And it's almost sad in the way that things turned out. And it leaves the audience with a question in the back of their minds. What happened? What could turn this into this? We go back to the present day with Zuko sleeping in the barn and the boy from earlier sneaking in and taking his swords out for some practice. These are dual swords. Two halves of a single weapon. Don't think of them as separate, because they're not. They're just two different parts of the same whole. Zuko explains to them how the sword should be wielded, but if you look below the surface, it has much more meaning. Throughout the show, Zuko is constantly dealing with an inner turmoil inside of him. His identity. Who are you? And what do you want? Zuko is always trying to be two people. On one hand, he wants to be the man that his father wants him to be. Cold, ruthless, a machine of war with scar to prove it. But at the same time, he wants to be the boy he was before the loss of his mother. Compassionate, caring, innocent. He wants to be both of these things, but neither one can ever win out, leaving Zuko constantly steaming in turmoil. But just as the swords are two halves of the same weapon, both of these people that Zuko is trying to be are both him. Neither one is his true self. They are both halves of the same whole. He is shaped by his compassion and his scars, his mother and his father, good and evil. Yin and Yang. Later on, we see Zuko heading to the center of town to save Lee, the boy from earlier. He pulled a knife on the soldiers trying to defend his family, a knife that Zuko gave him. Zuko feels some kind of connection to him. Throughout his whole life, he was taught that the other nations were inferior to the Fire Nation, but yet he still sees the kindness that this poor Earth Kingdom family has offered a total and perfect stranger. And Lee, he reminds Zuko of himself, feeling an obligation to try and guide Lee down the right path the path that Zuko didn't choose. Zuko draws his blades and begins to fight with a group of soldiers. He makes quick work of the first couple of soldiers, so now all that's left is the leader, the one who's been personally antagonizing Zuko and Lee's family. And he pretty much wipes the floor with Zuko. It isn't even close at first. His blades are no match for the soldiers' earthbending. This transitions us into the next flashback as Zuko gets knocked down. No matter how things may seem to change, never forget who you are. This whole episode, Zuko has been pretending. Pretending to be someone he isn't. An Earth Kingdom peasant, a nobody. Pretending to be weak. He was done pretending. He was done trying to make himself into two separate people. He was finally ready to embrace who he really is. Son of Ursa and Ozai. Fire Nation blood would always run through his veins. They would hate him for it. They always do, but... At least like this, he wasn't pretending. At least like this, he wasn't lying to himself. Zuko alone is so much more than a kid's cartoon episode. It teaches us that our past makes us who we are, but it doesn't define us. Only we can do that. Only we know our true identity. This is much more than just a kid's show. This is art.